There's an old saying, dead men tell no tales, but as it turns out, they do. It just takes an expert to hear them. And you're about to meet one of the best. We'll watch him open a coffin from the Civil War to try to solve a mystery more than a century old. Bob Brown with a forensic detective who leaves no bone unturned. There are people dead for thousands of years who still cast their shadows in Doug Owsley's office. Owsley can read history, picture life and death struggles, solve mysteries, understand how nature has changed, all from the study of bones. One of the first things he said to me was, I work in different kinds of worlds. In those seven words, I've never had anyone say that to me as a reporter or as a writer. It was like climbing into a time machine. And here, the time machine is one with seemingly never-ending corridors where Owsley walks daily. He is one of the most prominent scientists in the world in his specialty. And his workplace at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History contains the nation's largest collection of human remains in these drawers. Approximately 30,000 skeletons, each one a unique story. He'll teach you willingly how he begins to read them. There are sutures, like little fault lines in a skull, for instance, that grow together as we age. It's variable, but it's a fast way of looking at are you dealing with a child or a younger person versus an older adult. He reads those bones in a way that comes through the, the long experience he's had with skeletons. Author Jeff Benedict wrote an often astonishing book about Owsley, the discoveries he's made and the mysteries he's solved, called No Bone Unturned. One of the first things he said to me the day I met him was, you can learn more about a person from their skeleton than from anything else. He can tell you what kind of diet this person had by looking at the bone structure and other indications on the bone and on the wear of a person's teeth. And once you've figured out diet, you can start to figure out geography. Where did this person live? This is his latest project, the mystery behind a Civil War era cast iron coffin, a rarity to people in Owsley's line of work. The coffin was discovered when contractors excavated the site to build an industrial park in Pulaski, Tennessee. There was no grave marker, and no one is absolutely sure who the man in the coffin is. But because other members of a family named Mason were discovered here, there's speculation that the occupant may have been a Mason whose whereabouts are unknown, a Civil War soldier named Isaac Newton Mason. Descendants had a reason for wanting to know. I hope that it's Isaac Newton Mason and that we can take him back to Tennessee and that they'll put a marker on his grave and it'll be, uh, bring it full circle. Within a matter of hours, Owsley and his team will have drilled out the rusted bolts and begun to put together a picture of who this man was, his race and ancestry, and what role he played in the turbulent era when he died with his boots on. Okay. It wasn't as gruesome as I expected, because what was visible mostly was the mud and water-soaked clothing that covered the skeleton. Bob, would you like to come up and take a look? This right here, this, this may be part of a, uh, a bow tie, a silk bow tie. I'm not How sure. How do you maintain an emotional distance from what you're seeing? Sometimes it's not easy, but you have the ability to numb it out. I had a case that involved a lady this was when I was a graduate student, and she was a, a heavy set woman and in advanced decomposition, and, and it was one of those situations early on where I'd work for 10 minutes, I'd throw up for 10 minutes. I'd work for 10 minutes, I'd throw up for 10 minutes, and, and, and it just burned it out of me. We just need to clear the head. The investigators methodically begin their documentation, which is also a process of elimination. Whoever this man was, he was a cavalryman, not a foot soldier. How do they know? He's a very healthy skeleton, but one of the things we see is he has some back trauma. Evidence of stress on his bones tells them. Bone changes that can occur with horseback riding. A slight indentation here on the femoral head, which is called a Poyer's facet, which is also due to that pounding. See how the bone articulates? The bones also show that he didn't do regular physical labor. And since a large majority of Confederate soldiers were farmers and laborers, eliminating them narrows the pool even further. A check of the skull and other bones sets his age at 35 to 39. He had brown hair. 
and a microscopic examination showed it had just been cut before he was buried. Even the skeleton's dental condition is taken into account. Wealthier families like the Masons consumed more sugar and were more prone to tooth decay. He will add to the other skeletons that we have, that we have done from that time period and help us, help us understand what life, the harsh, harsh times that these, these men faced. Owsley, who is 52, is so involved in solving those mysteries that he sleeps on the floor of his office two or three nights a week, and he rarely watches television. His version of biography comes from bones that tell stories that otherwise might forever be hidden. Looking at bones found in the bottom of a well, for instance, Owsley recognized that this broken rib actually had been sliced by a knife. It turned into key evidence for a murder conviction 15 years after the crime. This skeleton, more than 130 years old, reveals devastating health problems. And one of the things about him is he has all of these distinctive perforations mm. in the ribs completely through the skeleton. What does this mean? This is cancer. Oh. And this is a case of multiple myeloma. Now, when What's the point of all this? To begin with, Owsley has done much more than analyze remains. He has helped write and rewrite history with his knowledge. And he's done it in many famous contemporary cases as well. When it was first assumed that Branch Davidian leader David Koresh had died by fire in the Waco compound, Owsley helped prove that Koresh took another way out while his followers burned. And so uh, some of the team that I worked with uh, helped us reconstruct that skull. And we could determine that there was a, a gunshot wound to the forehead here that exited out the back of the skull. And looking at how it was fragmented and, and the type of burning that occurred, you could tell that it was a, a gunshot wound that had occurred before the fire reached the body. From studying the trajectory of the bullet, Owsley also concluded that Koresh had one of his lieutenants pull the trigger and that the lieutenant then killed himself. It enabled him to reach the conclusion that David Koresh, unlike all his followers that died brutally in a fire, didn't because he was shot. One of Owsley's most extraordinary feats of detection involved the disappearance of two American journalists covering the Civil War in the highlands of Guatemala. Family members of the journalists Nicholas Blake and Griffith Davis had offered a reward for proof of whether they were alive or dead. And they'd been given boxes of remains by a Guatemalan contact that were little more than badly burned, gravel-sized bone fragments. No DNA identification was possible. My first real break on this came when I got two pieces of bone, and those pieces are right here. Owsley not only could tell that these tiny chips came from the sinus cavity of a skull, he knew that they represented an unusual deformity. We were able to find this little piece, it joined it, and then this little detached piece here actually sits right, sits right there. That's amazing. Then he determined there was nothing like that deformity in the Smithsonian's immense collection of skulls. So he obtained an x-ray of one of the men, Griffith Davis, and knew that if the tiny deformity matched the x-ray, it would be as good as a fingerprint. And I could trace out exactly the shape of that frontal sinus. And without a question, that's Griffith Davis. You had a perfect match. Had a perfect match. And that's a moment you just don't believe when you, when you just... You find that piece, you put it together, and then you just, you're just awestruck to see that. By establishing the identities of the men, who almost certainly had been murdered by people still unknown, Owsley allowed their families to end what had been a long and agonizing search. He's a guy, I think, that is so thirsty uh, for knowledge, for figuring out the puzzle, that the morbid nature of what he does doesn't click in. In fact, Owsley has so yeah, much passion for his work that he even risked his career for it, filing suit against his own employer, the federal government, for the right to study bones that were discovered on federal land in the Columbia River near Kennewick, Washington. The government wanted to give the skeleton to Indian tribes to rebury, but researchers were astonished to find that the bones were nearly 10,000 years old. The skull, Owsley said, looked very different from Native Americans and may indicate that more races of people than we previously had thought were arriving here by methods other than walking across the ancient land bridge from Asia. What we're now thinking is that you've got people coming in 
much earlier, thousands of years earlier. They're coming in by different modes of transportation. Those arguments didn't sway the government or Native American groups, who said studying the bones would violate the Indians' religion. We know as Indian people, we have always been here. We were here when time began. Nevertheless, Owsley and a group of scientists sued for the right to study the bones before they were reburied. They won, but the case is still tied up on appeal, and Owsley believes it could have major consequences for future studies. Oh, Kennewick Man is a, a case that I was willing to gamble it all on, in the sense that it's a situation where you could count on your fingers the number of well-preserved, carefully dated skeletons from that time period. So is it fair to say, then, that if you graduated from school seven or eight years ago, what you thought you knew about the way people got to North America has been blown out of the water by discoveries that have been made and science that's been done since then? It's been greatly challenged. This is what scares a lot of people. Um, it takes us way out of our comfort zone. It suggests to us that what we learned in our history books as students is uh, incomplete, if not wrong. I think there's a competitive edge that kicks in in the science mode, too. It's not that you want to be better than all the other scientists. It's that you want to beat the mystery. In the case of the Civil War soldier, Isaac Newton Mason, beating the mystery meant that the body could be reburied in a family cemetery in Tennessee in a ceremony that included people costumed from his era. There were no photographs of him. So from an MRI that the Smithsonian had taken of his skull, we commissioned a reconstruction of his face. First, the epoxy molds, then layers of clay to build the features of this man who served in the Confederate Army from 1861 to 1862, 36 years old, survived by a wife and three children, one man no longer anonymous. And although Doug Owsley himself may sometimes pass anonymously through the company of the 8 million people who visit this museum each year, he is, in his own way, a unique national treasure, a man at home in the company of bones, recent or ancient, fragments or skeletons. Whatever mystery they represent is to him a chance to leave his own mark on history. It's the history of our species. It's such a rich legacy, and the bones can tell you so much about it. <laughs>